that we meet The fellowship sweet Just to sit at your feet In this hour of prayer Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you'll turn there, please. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Let's begin with verse 1. Now, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. You may be seated. We are in desperate need of some teachers. It's, it's actually kind of embarrassing that we need teachers. You say, Brother Getsch, does the college need some more instructors? No, no, we're fine in the college. Brother Ewing needs teachers. No, no, Brother Ewing's got, got things in order in the school. Oh, the connection groups, we need some more. No, no, pastors, pastors got that taken care of. We need teachers in our homes. Amen. We need a teacher in your home. Have you noticed how focused the liberal left is on our kids? Have you noticed the momentum there that the, the liberal ideology seems to have when it comes to the youth of our day? Friend, it is not an accident that we are teaching gender issues in first grade. It's not just a coincidence that cartoons that your preschool children are watching have gay characters. It's not just, you know, it just happened that Disney went woke. That knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Redeeming the time, Paul said in Ephesians 5. Why? Why, why all this about, about time management? Why all this about a disciplined life? Why all this about our families and, and, and getting things in order? Why? Well, redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Valdemir Lenin the Soviet leader of the Soviet Union years ago said, give me a child for four years. After that, you can have him back. Because in that four years, Lenin said, I will plant seeds in his life that you will never uproot. It's an amazing statement. But you know, that's what God says. God says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. 
I sat down on an airplane years ago and a gentleman came in and sat beside me and it was kind of obvious who he was. He was a, he was a Jewish rabbi. We chatted a moment and he found out quickly that I was a Baptist preacher. The conversation over the next hour or so was pretty intense. We had a good discussion about Jesus, <laughs> about the Messiah. And I did my best to share some scripture with him and witness to him. And of course, he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so we differed. And I realized after about an hour that I was not going to make a whole lot of headway into his life with respect to the gospel. But this man intrigued me because every time I would use a verse of scripture from the Old Testament to try to prove that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, he would not only quote it in English before I could, but then he would quote it in Hebrew. And so after about an hour of talking about Jesus and not really getting anywhere, the conversation kind of died. And I said to him, I said, sir, could I ask you a, a question about a verse in the Old Testament? He said, sure. I said, Proverbs 22, 6. Without hesitation, he quoted it in English. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Then he quoted it in Hebrew, I think. He said, what's your question? I said, my question is, what does the word depart mean? Without hesitation, he said it means escape. That changed my perspective of that verse. Because I have watched over the years families raise their children. And I have witnessed, as you have, in the same family, one child does right and a ch another child does not. And so it comes to our mind then, well, then what does the Bible mean? The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. So if this family uh, brought their children up right, and they, they trained them properly, and they brought them to church, and they taught them the Bible, and they showed them how to be saved, and they showed them how to live for Christ, well, then if, if they departed from that, then, then they must not have done it right. But that's not what the verse means. The verse means when you train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he cannot escape that teaching. He may leave, he may depart. He may leave the church. He may, he may, he may say, I, I, I don't want to talk to you anymore. But he cannot escape the truth that is in his heart. Think of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, for whatever reason, decided, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be at home. I, I don't want to be under dad's control. I, I, don't, I don't want this anymore. I want the far country. I, I want to live my life the way I want to live it. And so he asks for his, his inheritance. His father grants it to him. And the Bible says this prodigal son departed. He left. He said goodbye to all the training, all the teaching, all the, all the stuff. He said, I'm out of here. He left. He departed to the far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. I mean, he lived the way he wanted to live. He, he lived in the, in the things of this world. He spent it all on the things that appealed to his flesh. But the Bible says, when he came to himself. Now, why did he come to himself? How did he come to himself? Were the pigs in the hog pen preaching to him, go home? Was the, the master that he had placed himself under for that job of, of feeding pigs, was he telling him, hey, you need to get your life straightened out? No. When he came to himself, where did he come to? He came to the instruction that was already in him. Amen. And the Holy Spirit used that instruction in his life to cause him to return. How can we ensure that our kids never escape the truth? 
Even though they may in seasons of their life rebel at what we're trying to teach or maybe get angry that we've got certain rules or we've got some policies with respect to how we're going to live or yes, we are going to church and they say, I don't want to go to church. How do we ensure, however, that they can never escape what we are placing into their life? I want you to see four foundational principles tonight as we need some teachers in our homes. First of all, we see in this passage a principal acknowledgement. Look at verse number four again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is a principal acknowledgement that is very important, that there is one God. Now, Satan hates this. Satan will fight this. Because the last thing Satan wants us to believe or our kids to know is that there's only one God. Lucifer in heaven one day rebelled against the one God. And he said, I want the glory here. I want the worship here. I want to be like God. I want to rise above God. I want to be worshiped. And God, of course, could not allow this. He cast Lucifer out of heaven. But ever since that time, the devil has been trying to build many gods. Because if the devil can convince us that there's a plurality of gods, then God can be whoever you want him to be. You can even be your own God. You can be the God of your own life. And the devil hates the fact that God is God and that's the only God that ever will be. Satan wants you to believe in multiplicity of gods so that he can be the God of your life or that you can be the God of your life. That's why Paul said, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. I love that statement, the simplicity that's in Christ. Believing in God, believing in one God is a simple concept. There is one person who is is in control of this universe. There is one person that is sovereign. There is one person that dictates to our life how it ought to be lived. And over and over again throughout the scripture, God reminds us that there is but one God. It is is a principle we must know and we must teach. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 35, unto thee it was showed thee, uh, O man, uh, uh, that, there, that, that the Lord, he is God, and there is none else. In Isaiah 45 and verse 22, I am the Lord, look unto me and be ye saved, for I am God, and there is none else. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 29, Jesus answered the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Paul said, one God, one Father of all, who's above all, who's through all, and who's in you all. Paul wrote to Timothy, there there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. One God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. A principal acknowledgement, we must believe there's but one God, and we've got to teach our children to know that there's one God, one authority, one Savior, one body of truth called the Bible. Now we add to that verse five, a premier affection. Notice verse five, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. One God, he's the creator God. He's the God who redeems us from our sin. He's the God that becomes the guide and keeper of our life. And now he reminds us that we must have a premier affection for this God. Why? Because every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And that God who created us, that God who redeemed us, that God who cares for us tonight is a God of love. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. God doesn't just show love. God doesn't just uh, 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 contain love. God is love. And God loves me. 
God so loved the world, and I'm a part of the world. God loves me. Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, and with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God commendeth, God proved, God manifested, God made known his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't just say, I love you. He proved it by sending his son to die on a cross for our sins. And so John says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Our love is a reciprocal love. It's a response love. It's a reactionary love. It's a love that is born in the fact that we know God loves me. And so therefore, I want to love God. Now, O Israel, what doth the Lord require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to love him, and to serve him with all of thy heart and with all of thy soul? John said, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, we teach our children, it's a good thing to teach our children to love their mommy and daddy, to love you. We teach our children to love each other. That makes for a happy home when we love each other. Maybe you've taught your kids to love your favorite sports team, and they're a fan of your team because you taught them to love that team. You've taught your kids to love certain kinds of food. You, you've taught your kids maybe to, to, to love uh, uh, certain things about, about work and, and the work ethic. You've taught them to work hard and have good character. You've taught them to love certain things. But have you taught them to love God? Have we taken time on our list to say, how am I going to teach my children that there's one God and that I must love that God? I must respond to him in love. Now, that's going to take more than words. John said, little children, let us not love in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth. If we're going to teach our children to love God, we're going to have to be the example of loving God. I was um, teaching a speech communications camp this, this last week at the Joshua camps, and we were talking about uh, gestures. We were talking about body movement. We were talking about facial expression and how all those things help to communicate the message that we're delivering. And they're so very important. In fact, oftentimes, those things communicate louder than our words. I can't imagine when Peter denied the Lord that third time and the Bible says Jesus turned and looked upon Peter. He never said anything. Can you imagine that look of disappointment? Peter, just a few hours before, had said, I'll die for you, but I'll never deny you. And now he's denied the Lord. And just with a simple movement of Jesus' head, he turned and looked at Peter. And the Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. Action, movement, facial expression. And I told the kids this, tell me how much you love Jesus. Use words only if necessary. Now sometimes as parents, we're really good at the words. We're going to church now. Behave yourself. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> we love Jesus. And if you don't act like it, you'll find out when we get home. <laughs> you know, we, we're real good with the words. But then we sleep in church. Or we're not friendly. Or we don't sing in worship. We've got to love an example. And so we see here a principal acknowledgement. There's one God. There's a premier affection, and that is to love that God. And behind it, we have a powerful authority. 
And you say, well, Brother Gadget, I, I, I don't know anything about teaching. I, I mean, yeah, I've got some kids, but I, I've never been trained to teach. I don't, I don't know how to communicate truth. I, I, I don't know how to effectively, you know, get into my kids' hearts and minds. I, I, I don't know what I would tell them. I don't know what I would show them. I, I, I don't know what to teach. Look at verse 6. And these words, these words which I've commanded thee shall be in thine heart. See, you have the textbook. You, you have the curriculum. You have the lesson plans. The first time that I ever preached outside of a classroom, I took homiletics my junior year in college. I wasn't called to preach until that year. And so my second semester, I, 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 I got in a homiletics class and they taught us some things about preaching and we had to get up and teach in, or preach in class. And I did that. That summer, I went to serve at a church as a, a summer intern. And the church was, was growing and the youth group especially was, was getting large and the pastor had decided that they needed to split the youth group. The youth group was large enough to where they, they were gonna get ready in that fall season to call a, a, an assistant youth pastor. Someone that would take the junior hires and kind of form their own Sunday school class and have their own activities and, 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 and kind of bring these, these groups down a little bit in size. And so the youth pastor that was there, he was going to take the senior hires and this new man was going to take the junior hires. Well, during that summer, the pastor pulled me aside and he said, now, I'd like you to start doing a few things with the junior hires to kind of prepare them for this transition. And so he said, I, I want you to plan some activities. The youth pastor will help you for just junior hires. And on top of that, I want you to take a couple of Sundays and, and just separate the junior hires out from the senior hires and teach a Sunday school lesson to the junior hires. And he said, we'll start this Sunday. <laughs> and, and, and boy, I, I kind of I kind of froze on that. You know, I thought, man, I, I've never I've never preached. I've, ne I've never given a lesson. And I thought, what am I going to what am I going to teach these junior hires? Well, I had one message I had preached in homiletics and I thought that's what they're going to get. <laughs> it was called 30 pieces of silver and it was about Judas betraying the Lord. And I thought, that's going to be the lesson. I don't know if it ties in with anything else we're doing, but that's the lesson for this Sunday for the junior hires. And so the class was going to meet in the kitchen of the church. And uh, they cleared out some tables and they put some chairs in there. And that's where my class was going to meet. And I remember being extremely nervous and, and, and thinking junior hires and just holding their attention for 30 minutes is a challenge. And, and, and I've got this message, but it's really not for junior hires. And, and I was just really nervous about it. But I prayed, I worked at it, and I went down there to that, that kitchen. And uh, junior hires were starting to filter in. I was trying to uh, go around, talk to some of them, and they were getting all in there. And, and right before the, the start time, the pastor's wife walked in. And she sat down in the back row. And I thought, that, oh, you gotta be kidding. The pastor sent his wife down here to spy on me. See if I'm doing anything heretical, you know, or whatever. And I thought, oh, this is terrible. Her pastor, what, or her husband was a great preacher. The reason I went to that internship, because I just wanted to hear the pre pastor preach. I mean, what drew me to that internship that summer was he came preaching in chapel. And I thought, boy, I'd like to hear that guy preach more. And, and he said, I need a couple of interns this summer. And so I signed up. And I basically went to that church to, to just listen to him preach. He was an outstanding preacher. And here she is, sitting in my class, and I thought, she's gonna think this is awful, this is terrible. Well, I stumbled through it, and, and uh, the kids sorta of stayed awake, and I, I, I made it through. I, I felt like I, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. But at the end, as the junior hires left and went up to the service, Mrs. Poorman, she stood there in the back, and she was a very, a very uh, humble lady. She was, she was short, she was very petite, and, and she was very humble. She, she was not uh, you know, in the open a lot as a pastor's wife. She was kind of behind the scenes, but a wonderful pastor's wife. And she was standing back there with her Bible like this, and she came up to me, and I thought, oh boy. And she said, John, that was good. I thought, oh, okay, 
That's good. That's like a B. <laughs> you know? She didn't say that was excellent. She said, that was good. And I said, well, well thank you. I wasn't expecting you to be down here. And uh, I said, Mrs. Foreman, I, I just don't know where your husband gets all his sermons. And I will never forget for the rest of my life what she did and what she said. She put her Bible out in front of her and she said, John, they're all in here. And she walked away and I thought, wow. <laughs> yeah, they're all in here. I don't know where they are, but they're in here. And you may be a new parent tonight. You may have some very small children, and you're thinking, how in the world am I going to raise these kids? Maybe you're expecting your first child, and you're thinking, boy, this is a big step for us, and, and, and how are we going to do this? And maybe you've got some teenagers, and, and, and maybe, maybe you're just getting saved and getting plugged in, and, and you're not really sure. Or maybe you have been saved a while, and you've been in the church, and you've been trying to do things right, and, and yet you're at a, a point in, in your home where you're thinking, I'm not sure this is working. Listen, you don't have to change the textbook. You don't have to get some new and improved curriculum. It's all right here. And may I say, it is powerful. As the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the, beater, the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I send it to do. God will use his word. Why? Because it's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You say, yeah, but I, I just don't know if my kids will listen. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just their dad. I'm just their mom. I don't have the authority that like pastor does when he stands up to preach or, or somebody like that, a Sunday school connection group leader. I, I, I don't have, wait a minute. Shortly after my wife and I were married, the pastor who married us, my wife grew up as a bus kid in a, in a church in Rockford, Illinois. She rode the bus as a child and got saved and started getting in the youth group and eventually went to Bible college. And, and uh, that's where we met. And, and uh, so when we started thinking about getting married, we talked to her pastor and, and uh, he, he counseled us a little bit and, and he agreed to do the ceremony and all those kinds of things. And so over those, those months and years, I, I got to know Dr. Ralph Martin. And he was a seasoned pastor, had a wonderful family, five children, and they were mostly grown by that time, and at least in their teen years and so on. And, and uh, I admired him greatly, built a great church there, and certainly had cared for my wife as a, as a bus kid and, and seen her come up through the ranks. And, and I, I respected him highly. And, and he invited me to come and preach a revival meeting at that church. Well, I was honored. I mean, I'm just starting out in ministry, and I haven't... Uh, this church, they, they had two revivals every year in the spring and the fall, and they had some of the, the greatest known evangelists of the time. And I thought, what do you want me for? But, but he invited me to come, and I did an eight-day meeting, Sunday morning through the next Sunday night, eight days of meetings. I think I preached uh, something like 14 or 15 times in that week of, of meetings. And we had a, a good week, I thought, and we got to the end of the week, and Mr. Uh, Mrs. Martin and Dr. Martin, we, they, they were staying in the lobby uh, with my wife and I, and we were kind of saying our goodbyes, and it had been a, a, a busy week, and everybody else had gone, and we were just standing there and, and chatting a little bit. And, and Dr. Martin, he kind of pulled me aside a little bit, and he pulled me away from our wives, and he said, uh, Brother Getch, he said, this has been a good week. He said, we've had good attendance, and the people have been encouraged. We've seen some good decisions. You've helped our church. Well, I, was, I felt good that, that I, the pastor was pleased, you know, with the week of meetings. And then he kind of had a change of expression a little bit. And he said, now, John, you preached 14 or 15 times. He said, I would have thought that somewhere in 14 or 15 messages that you would have preached at least once on the family, on the home. And I kind of laughed. I said, oh, Dr. Martin, that's your job. 
You know, I saw myself as a young evangelist, and we preached the gospel, and we try to stir up people for soul winning, and those kinds of things. And, I, and, and so I thought, well, Pastor, that's your job. And I kind of laughed. He didn't laugh. And he stepped even closer into my personal space. And he said, John, you have just as much authority to preach on the home as I do. Because your authority is not in your experience. Your authority is in this book. Wow. You know, I went out of that meeting and the next week I wrote my first message on the family. I wrote my first message on the home and I began to preach that. And when I would preach it, I'd say, now I know what you're saying. I, I tr have turned to Ephesians chapter five and I said, tonight we're gonna talk about the home. And I, I'd say, now I know what you're thinking. What are you as a 24 year old evangelist gonna tell me about my marriage? You've been married like a year. You don't have any kids. And I said, I don't have anything to tell you, but we're gonna find what we need to know right here. And you know, I found people going, oh, that's true. Let's find out what it says. And listen tonight, you have in your hands a powerful authority in the word of God. And notice finally, not only a principal acknowledgement, one God, we've got to teach that. We've got to believe it. We've got to teach it. There's a premier affection. We've got to love that God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. And then we have a powerful authority to back us up, the Word of God. But then, and I love what Pastor said earlier, a planned affirmation. Now, first, according to verse six, the Word of God has to be in our heart. Do you notice it there in verse six? These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So it's gotta start with us as the parent, as the teacher. It's gotta be in us. But then look at verse seven. And thou shalt teach them the words that are in your heart diligently unto thy children. And he goes on to say, talk of it when you're in the way, talk of it when you sit down, talk of it when you rise up, right on the post of your house, on your gates. In other words, saturate everything in your family with the Word of God. A planned and perpetual presentation of truth so that everywhere they look, everything they hear, all of their experiences all come back to the Word of God. You say, Brother Gatch, that, that sounds like a lot of work. It's our children. It's our future. We've got to affirm it constantly. Because if all we do is bring our kids to church, well, there's 168 hours in a week. So even if we bring our kids to church three times a week, that's going to have to counteract 165 hours of other influence. If that's all we do is say, well, I'm going to bring him to Sunday school and let the Sunday school teacher teach him. I'm going to make sure they're in the youth group. Let, let Brother Chapel have at them, you know. I'm going to make sure that, 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 that they're here on Wednesday night, you know, and they'll get, they'll, get, they'll get some teaching. If all you do is do that three hours, you still have 165 hours out there. You've got to counteract. You say, well, I'll put them in the Christian school. Great. That's six hours a day. Who's going to influence the other 18? That's why the world's winning the battle, folks. Because God says we've got to have a planned affirmation. Train up a child in the way he should go. You fathers, provoke not your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As Timothy, who Paul said, when I called remembrance, the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it is in thee also. That grandmother, that mother had taken the time to put in Timothy on a constant, perpetual, and planned affirmation of the Word of God. 
when our oldest son John was four, maybe five. He's 45 now, so that's, that's 40 years ago. We were at a camp preaching to teenagers one summer. And, and John was the kind of kid that when something was going on at a camp, and we, we spent a lot of time in camp ministry, and, and uh, when something was going on at camp, even as a little kid, he wanted to be right there where the action was. I mean, if there was an activity, he wanted to go watch it. If it was skit night, he wanted, he wanted to see the skits. If there was a service, he wanted to be in the service. Snack shop was open, he wanted to be in the snack shop. I mean, no matter what it was at camp, John wanted to be in the middle of it. And in a camp, you're in a very safe environment. You know, as a parent, you're thinking, you know, nothing's going to go wrong here. Uh, he's around godly people, counselors are watching over him, campers love the Lord, and you, you know, and, and so we would, we would oftentimes go ourselves with him, and we'd watch activities, and we would, you know, obviously go to the services, and, and we did things together as a family at camp. But there were other times where, you know, we got to, uh, you know, do other things, and, and so we'd say, John, you, you can go, you, you go, you know where it is, and you go, and you enjoy watching that activity, but when it's over, you come back, and, and you check with us, and, and uh, so he would do that. Well, one day it was a hot, it was a hot, humid day, and they were having an activity down on the ball field, and, and I needed to do some sermon prep for that evening, and my wife was taking care of Melinda, who was just a baby, and, and, uh, and trying to get her down for a nap, and John said, I want to go to that activity. I said, okay, John, you can go, but now um, when it's over, when that, when that bell rings and they go on to the next thing, you come back to the trailer. I want to check on you, make sure you're okay, and you need to, you know, stay hydrated, get some water and whatever. And so I said, you come back after that activity. And so he ran out the door. Boy, he was excited he got to go. So he runs down to the ball field. And he watches this activity, has a great time. Bell rings. Kids go on to the next thing. And John comes running back to the trailer. And he opens that screen door. I remember I was sitting there on the ta- at the table working on a message and my wife was in the back getting the baby down and John burst in that trailer and he said, Mom, Mom, I need a drink, I need a drink. <laughs> and his face is bright red, he's sweating. He said, I need a drink. And Diane said, I'll be just a minute, son. And John said, shut up, Mom. Whoa. Time stood still. (laughs) We did not use the term shut up in our home. And when he said that, it was like, it was a very surreal few seconds. Even our dog, we had a miniature schnauzer at that time. and, and, and Scotty was his name, and he was up in the upper area of the fifth wheel trailer sleeping on the bed. And, and, and when, when John said those words, the dog looked up and he saw me, and he jumped off the bed and ran to the armrest of the couch and, and, and sat there right in front of that armrest. And he, and, and he sat like a statue, but he was just trembling because he knew. <laughs> what was coming. He, he was the perfect example of the verse in the Bible that says, cast out the scorner and the simple shall be made wise. <laughs> and I said, John, where did you hear that? Now, my boys were all very tender hearted. In other words, if if I raised my voice a little bit, or, or they could tell that I was frustrated a little bit with them, my, my boys generally would break. I mean, they, they, just, they, they just had that spirit that, that if they knew they were in trouble, they were already broken. Now, my daughter was a different story, but <laughs> she later become the most submissive in life. But the point was that the boys, John especially, and when I said that, he just began to weep. He just began to cry. And he said, he started crying. He pointed out the screen door. He said, big kids, big kids. Oh, he had heard the teenagers say, shut up. And it worked. So he thought, I'll try that on mom. (laughs) Well, we sat down with John for a minute. And we tried to explain to him that that was not appropriate, that was not right, 
that was sinful and there's punishment for sin and for a four and five year old you have to deal with that quickly you have to deal with it directly and you have to deal with it somewhat painfully and we did when John was 18 he went to college we were not here in Lancaster at that time John went to college I was pretty excited for him. He was going to get to play football. He played football in high school, and, and now he was going to play football in college. And I was pretty excited about that. John was a full-grown man now, 18 and a half inch neck, 270 pounds. He went out for football, and he did well. I loved going to his games and watching him play. Started several games in the offensive line and got to play on special teams, and I loved every minute of it. Football season ended there in the college and spring football started and they're working out and getting, you know, getting some work done over the, over the spring break or over the spring uh, semester. And in those days, I was, I was holding meetings Sunday to Wednesday. We, we were leaving the family home so John could go to college, the other kids could be in regular school. And I was, I was trying to manage that with holding revival Sunday to Wednesday. Wednesday night after service, I'd drive home and, and uh, sometimes all night, get there Thursday morning, get a little rest. And kids would come home and we'd try to go to their games, go to concerts, go to you know piano recitals, whatever they had going, try to be a part of their life. And then Saturday, get back in the car, drive to the next meeting. And that was kind of the way our life went there for that year. In fact, for several years. And that spring, I, I, I came home. I had driven all night. It was Thursday morning by the time I got home, and, and uh, it was close to noon, and, and I pulled in the driveway. We lived in the, in the country. We lived out in the, in the middle of nowhere, and I pulled in, and, and John's car was there. And my first thought was, oh, man, that car has broke down again. John had an old Oldsmobile that I bought from my dad, and it, it, it was constantly breaking down. And it seemed like every week when I'd come home, there was something I had to fix on that dumb car. And I saw that car there, and I thought, that car's broke down. And I was weary, I was tired, and I, I walked up the stairs and into the house and greeted Diane. And I said, is John's car broke down again? She said, no, I don't think so. I said, well, it's sitting in the driveway. And I knew at that particular time of the day, John would be at the college. He'd be working out. He'd, they, they had weight training and spring football. And I, I, I thought, well, where is he? Why, why is his car here? She said, well, I think I, he's here. I said, he's here. Where is he? She said, I think he's down in the basement. Down in the basement. We lived in a, in a house that was built in 1890. It wasn't a house, it was a barn, it was a cheese factory. And we turned it into a house. The basement had nothing in it. I mean, it, was, it, it had these huge high ceilings, but there was nothing down there. Well, there was the water softener, there were snakes, there were rats, I mean, there were, there were, there were I had a toolbox down there, and, and there was an old weight bench, and, and she said, yeah, I think, I think he's down there lifting weights. I said, what? Lifting weights? In the basement? I mean, at the college, they have, they have weight machines, they have trainers, they have whirlpools, they have all this stuff going on. What, what in the world? I put my stuff down, I, I walked down the stairs to the basement, and I opened one of those inner doors, and sure enough, there's John with the weight bench, and he's pumping iron. I waited till he was done with his reps. He kind of sat up, looked at me, and I said, hey, John. He said, hey, Dad. I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm lifting. I said, yeah, I got that. Why? Why aren't you lifting at the school? His head kind of hung and he, he said, Dad, some of the guys in the weight room, they don't talk right. I decided I don't need that. I decided to lift at home. Okay. I backed up and closed the door. As soon as that door closed, I went, yes! <laughs> he got it! 
Because when your kid is 270 pounds with an 18 and a half inch neck, you're not going to be able to deal with that like you did when they're four or five. You see, we got to get this nurturing going. We got to get this truth in. And there may not always be that immediate response, but when they're old, they can't escape it. Let's bow for prayer. We need some teachers. You ready to apply? If you got kids, if you've got grandkids, well, you ought to be filling out an application right now with the Lord. Just saying, God, I, I don't know everything there is to know about parenting. I don't know everything there is to know about a family. And I don't know everything there is to know about time management. And I, and I, I don't know, but Lord, you've given me an opportunity in my home. And the world wants my kids. And the culture is stealing them away faster and faster than we can even recognize our future, the future of this church, the future of our nation depends upon teachers in the home. The school can't do it for us. The church can't do it for us. And whether you're a nuclear family or whether you're a single mom, sign up to be a teacher tonight. Lord, thank you for giving us the lesson plans. Thank you for giving us the power behind those curriculums of your word. Now, Lord, give us the grace and the courage to be that example in our home of not only saying the right things, but living the right things, teaching our children. There's one God and that God loves us and we need to love him. Using the Word of God to support everything in our conversations, in our lifestyles, that build that Word into their lives so that, Lord, as they get older, as they even leave home and go out on their own, Lord, they cannot escape the truth that they've been given. And so help us to answer the call tonight for teachers. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand quietly with heads bowed. The altar's open. Music is playing. I'll take just a moment. But tonight, ask the Lord to make you the right kind of teacher in your home. I'm afraid sometimes we, we say, well, I just don't have time. I, I just don't know if I can. But when that's our spirit, we're teaching, but we're teaching the wrong stuff. And so tonight, say, Lord, my children, they're important. My grandchildren, they're important. The children of this church, they're important because they're the future. And when we teach, we have the privilege of writing the history of the future because we're writing it through our children. Be that teacher. God wants you to be. Let's take some time in prayer tonight. Every parent, every grandparent, teachers are wanted, needed. Our Father in heaven, tonight we pray that you would use us as parents and grandparents to instill truth into the next generation and to live truth before them. Please bless the families of this church. 
Please help us to be vigilant in this day when there are so many false teachers. Help the children to be attentive and tender. May this upcoming fall season be a great step forward in the education of the young people of this church and of these families, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.